If you're building a distributed engineering team and you want to hire the best and the brightest from around the world, you're going to want to listen to today's episode with Vijay Krishnan, CTO of Turing.com. Welcome to the Productive AI Podcast, where we aim to simplify AI and make it more accessible to business leaders. I'm your host, Troy Angredon, and today we're talking to Vijay about what he and his co-founder are doing in this rocket ship company they're building to help provide fantastic interesting engineering jobs to folks all over the world. VJ, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Troy. Also at the end, what we're going to do, uh, I've already given uh, VJ a little heads up on this. If you stick around, I'm going to ask him at the end for his thoughts on advice to AI company entrepreneurs and founding teams, given that he's building a company with a huge AI focus, as well as what to think about if you're interested in being in the engineering side of an ML or AI career and how to think about developing your career in that space. He has a long history in the space going all the way back to 2007 before ML was cool. So we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, before we get there, let's uh, let's dive into the meat of the conversation. So now Vijay, I kind of just touched on it, but you have an extensive background. You started in ML way before it was cool back in Yahoo in 2007, 2008. Did you sort of plot out your career and end up here? Or do you look backwards from here at all the steps and say, ah, those things led me here and this is how I got here. So I'm curious about, you know, the, the path you took and how long you've been in the field and, and how you arrived at this company. Yeah, uh, great uh, question, Troy. So I don't know that uh, um, I, well, I did believe AI um, would be big, but nobody could have quite predicted uh, necessarily that this 2012-2013, basically um, the reboot of uh, neural networks uh, by way of uh, deep learning would uh, take AI to a whole new level. Um, in fact, um, I think my uh, earliest entry into uh, the field of AI was uh, back in my undergraduate days, back in 2003. I had uh, started to write some uh, strong uh, papers uh, on the applications of machine learning in uh, different conferences like SIGIR, uh, EMNLP, and uh, so on. So, uh, so at that, uh, I would say until 2007, uh, I, I was uh, doing this uh, both uh, back at IIT Bombay and at Stanford University as a as an AI researcher. Really, uh, as you uh, you said, 2007 onward, I started applying this to problems in the industry. I think personally, uh, I like the, I have always been uh, a lover of uh, probability and statistics, which is uh, so much at the foundation of uh, a lot of uh, modern uh, machine learning. And it, it just uh, happened to be something uh, that I loved, I was good at, and that seemed to have some practical value. I didn't know it would be this much practical value at that point. And then now, where did you go from Yahoo? So um, uh, I, I was a scientist at uh, Yahoo uh, in their machine learning team, uh, applying uh, uh, ML to problems in text categorization, uh, personalization, and so on. I started my uh, my previous uh, company, uh, Rover, uh, soon afterward. Uh, so we started off doing uh, personalized uh, search. We did that for a certain period of time, and then later moved into the space of uh, personalized content uh, discovery instead. So I ran that company for a um, uh, for a while, and uh, that company got acquired about uh, four years back. So uh, 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 when uh, it came to personalized content uh, re recommendations, what we did was we uh, we uh, um, based on your past uh, web uh, browsing data, we would mm -hmm. build uh, deep user profiles the same way uh, Google and Facebook builds uh, deep uh, user profiles, and we would use that to recommend other content that you may uh, like. So a lot of machine learning went into uh, categorizing your content, uh, figuring out what your uh, interests are, um, uh, then uh, uh, doing the same uh, when it came to uh, new uh, novel stories. Uh, at that point, we had to both figure out uh, topicality of uh, different stories, as well as how interesting they would be. Ideally, you want a story that uh, uh, matches your interests, as well as is uh, interesting in absolute uh, uh, terms. And you had some huge reach. This was this was Rover, which was acquired by Rev Content, and it, if mm -hmm. I remember, it was something like a billion and a half users monthly, or something like it had huge scale. That's right. That's right. So uh, uh, that's right. So Rover itself got to forty million uh, uh, registered uh, users, and uh, 
uh, I think after our acquisition by Rev Content, we uh, we certainly got to reach a much 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 larger uh, scale applying our uh, technology to uh, Rev Content. So uh, you know, Rev Content certainly saw billions of uh, yeah over a billion uh, monthly uh, uh, unique visitors across uh, a whole uh, range of their publisher partners. It was very very exciting to uh, deploy our personalization uh, technology to data of that scale. Excellent. That makes sense. Now, where does the, uh, now you're, you, as we said at the beginning of the call, you're an ML guy from way, way back in the day. Uh, you've been doing this stuff all the way from school, actually. Is there real machine learning and, you know, AI, if you want to go there uh, or any of these kinds of tools are, are, do they truly exist inside your platform? And if so, kind of, what does that look like? Sure. Sure. So we use it in a, uh, a number of places, but I'll talk about some of the most uh, exciting and the most uh, uh, impactful uh, play, uh, places uh, where uh, they uh, this thing where they play a role at Turing. I would say uh, it, it is uh, really in uh, in the building of uh, deep uh, developer profiles as it uh, relates to uh, uh, which in turn helps us make uh, um, uh, make uh, much better quality matches and even helps mm -hmm. us improve our tests itself. So today okay. we uh, we think of uh, I mean we think of uh, the whole uh, problem of developer testing and uh, interviewing as uh, as a machine learning problem really we hmm. we uh, uh, when a when a software developer from this country signs up we don't know anything about them a priori right. we think there's a one to two percent chance that uh, uh, they uh, they would be matchable uh, to a customer now okay. uh, and uh, then the way we see it is. Uh, the job of our tests is to be as efficient as possible. And in, in a sense, if the prior probability is like one uh, percent, can we either move it? Uh, um, uh, can we make sure that each minute of uh, that we spend testing a developer helps us rapidly move uh, move that probability estimate either upward or downward? Either mm -hmm. uh, go go towards zero percent or go toward hundred percent. Don't uh, you know? Don't waste a developer's time with something that doesn't uh, quite uh, give you very much signal. And right. the nice thing now is that because we are a again uh, there uh, because we are a nice uh, sort of vertically integrated solution that goes all the way from sourcing, vetting, matching, uh, and even uh, collaboration after the match, even rematches, mm -hmm. all sorts of th things like this. We have access to all sorts of data that may very many players don't. Like for example, <laughs> there are there are uh, companies that have a SaaS uh, so solution for uh, administering programming tests but they don't have a full uh, full cycle data that tell, uh, that provides any kind of machine learning based trained data regarding what is actually important i mean right. uh, if, uh, yeah uh, i mean these so would be traditional as we talked about traditional staff og companies that if you said to them hey i want to instrument the, the apps you're using for testing pull all the data off spin it into a database and then actually use that as part of our deep neural network they'd say i don't even know what you just said to me <laughs> like, right 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 <laughs> yeah okay so you're yeah. basically saying look we own this whole process from start to finish let's pull off as much data as we can and run it through the tooling that we know right yeah, because we we also have a, a lot of nice end-to-end -end, uh, data with regard to I mean almost in in machine learning parlance I would say it is uh, it is uh, ground truth labels. So every uh, we can look at uh, all the successful developer collaborations at Turing. We can look at the handful of unsuccessful ones. We can look mm -hmm. at other ones where, uh, where where we placed a developer before a customer, but uh, the the customer said, "Well, uh, I talked with this person. Uh, I don't think the match is quite right for for reasons A, B, C. This person is not quite it." Now sure. all these uh, serve as kind of you can say uh, positive and negative training examples, and this yeah. helps us in turn tell us. What, what is even important from a vetting perspective? What actually predicts success in a sense? Yeah. What predicts success? What the, the, you know, what is an unnecessary- You're doing feature engineering here. You're basically, you're really just using all these inputs and all these outputs as, as, as you said, training data to make the system better at matching. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And and today hiring is uh, just uh, you know uh, it's it's just a matter of like religious uh, debates. Uh, VPs yes. in some company believe uh, this is the right way to vet. Some uh, VPs in other companies disagree. We uh, uh, we can we can try everything and we can f figure out what predicts success with what kind of customers. I mean, right. there are certain kinds of customers uh, where uh, uh, perhaps uh, algorithm skills and data structures and all that really matters. There are other kinds of customers where uh, specific knowledge of your tech st stack and uh, uh, being an excellent communicator and having product sense and things like that uh, tends to matter. So, uh, right, there would be yeah, no no universal uh, algorithm that could predict the best um, person for all companies. And I'm sure you must you must end up segmenting your companies mm -hmm. into small clusters or clustering them into small clusters where they have 
uh, you would want similar people for them to you know achieve certain attributes or whatever. That's absolutely right. Absolutely. And, and so, uh, so, so and it's and amazing to see so many of our, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 so, uh, so many of our earlier intuitions, uh, even uh, occasionally, uh, um, uh, pretty much disproved by uh, by our end to end data. Uh, that, yeah. uh, uh, like um, uh, Jonathan and I, uh, uh, I guess our uh, uh, Stanford grads have worked with the. Uh, I mean, we have, we have seen a lot of the hiring processes at the Googles and Facebooks of the world. Our VP of engineering used to be a former eng manager at Facebook as well, managing a large team and everything. So we we brought in certain ideas with regard to what is important, but it was very help, very, very uh, eye-opening to see um, what uh, um, uh, what actually matters, uh, how uh, uh, maybe uh, um, uh, a notion of uh, who is successful uh, um, uh, uh, doesn't perfectly match our intuition. That is super cool. And I always laugh because people, I've had this conversation a lot and people say, oh, AI is so terrible because it's so biased. And I say, have you seen any process run by humans lately? Because they're all terrible. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean. <laughs> you know, We're the worst yeah. version of bias. It's, <laughs> machines will probably be a step up from where we are. Right, right. <laughs> uh, Excellent. Uh, I, I have seen, uh, in fact, it's funny. Uh, I I actually had uh, uh, exactly these kind of uh, discussions with uh, so many AI startups, and uh, I've I've had this conversation so many times. When I asked, "Well, isn't this a really difficult problem for AI to solve?" Yeah, yeah. And uh, they asked, "Do you know? Uh, do you know what the humans uh, we are uh, competing against are actually producing today?" <laughs> and uh, all we have to do is beat that. We don't have to build a perfect AI. That's right. We have to have 10 times less bias than the humans. And then, frankly, that's yeah. probably a pretty low bar. <laughs> uh, <that's true. laughs> All right. So let's talk about where you guys are at, because you guys just raised some uh, another round, I think. So uh, where are you at in terms of stage of the company and, and funding and all that? If you are an engineer and you want to get into the space or you're just at the beginning of your career, any advice for those folks? Because you've had a long and super interesting career in the space. Uh, you're talking uh, AI specifically? Yeah, ML, AI, let's say specifically, since that's kind of the focus of, of the show here. Perfect. Yeah, yes, I do have some thoughts. So here again, I'll, I'll share maybe what uh, other people are less likely to say, <laughs> but, but, uh, but sure. I believe to be true, uh, since yeah. that is what would be most valuable. So here, I would say one of the things that is, uh, that is just not done enough is uh, uh, really understanding the, the, the fundamentals, understanding the math, uh, mathematics, getting, uh, getting enough of a solid grounding in the, in the probability and, the, uh, and statistics and all that stuff. Like, well, I think one of the, uh, one of the ma uh, major problems I see with, uh, with this thing, with the, with the state of uh, machine learning uh, uh, talent and uh, I guess the, um, w what is getting common is uh, a lot of the, well, it seems to be widely believed that uh, the way you become an AI engineer is you don't need to know any of that stuff. You don't need to know what uh, what any of these things are doing. You don't need to know how models work. Uh, oh, TensorFlow has all that stuff figured out. All you need to do is uh, download TensorFlow, download a few, uh, upload a few data sets in it, tinker with it a little bit, and you become an AI engineer. No, the the degrees of freedom are just too many. I, I think uh, the, there is a sense in which you. Uh, the 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 kind of uh, things you can you you can bring to bear uh, 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 that uh, that can make you uh, unlock enormous uh, amounts of uh, effectiveness and efficiencies grow dramatically if you really really understand the the, uh, the mathematics behind the stuff the the fundamentals of what the model is doing uh, what mm -hmm. does this optimization even uh, look like uh, like for example if uh, you know, the, the the sort of thing that actually uh, uh, even happens in uh, in uh, machine learning classes at Stanford or other top universities the sort of thing where you you write your own toy training algorithm at least you you sort of understand what this is doing uh, you you understand what gradient descent is you understand uh, what what the model's constraints are and so on so I would uh, the, this is by far I, I I think the area where I would uh, suggest that more people uh, spend time and this uh, this apart of course you know uh, there is the other angle the the practical angle of this that you never want to be doing AI for AI's sake. You you always want to understand enough for business and product. You always want to make sure you're doing like the simplest possible thing that is also maximally effective. You want to put that hat on always. Uh, the more complicated right. uh, you do something, the harder it is to extend, the harder it is to draw lessons from that, the harder it's to debug uh, or, uh, or, 
odds are maybe the uh, you'll have a harder time even uh, getting it past the production team they may be like well your model size is too big your uh, this thing it hogs too much memory it's going to be mm-hmm. a nightmare putting it there here and there so y- yes right. you you do want to understand a, a, a lot of those aspects also so a, a lot of the pragmatic aspects of it you need to have this extreme bias toward simplicity and effectiveness at the same time and and really really understand the underlying mathematics otherwise you, you're very handicapped i mean you're you're kind of you know uh, uh, you're you're walking in a in some dark alley with uh, uh, nothing to guide you in the right direction yeah and i think that this is essentially what i'm hearing from you is learn the primitives learn the foundations learn them well and then you can go for the easier tools that sit above it because you know what those tools are doing you know if they're working you know if they're going off the rails or leading you astray but if you don't have that foundational knowledge and you're using those mid-level let's say middleware type tools you're just pushing buttons at that point and if that's it right, goes right. and it breaks you have no idea you have nowhere to go at that point yeah I, I, yes absolutely i mean i wouldn't I, i don't know if i would necessarily say do this first versus that but but make sure to understand that this is an important hole that has to be filled first even if you started tinkering with the tools first understand that to uh, to become a re- really uh, effective ml engineer they they assume their job is done you know i'm doing uh, yeah. i i know everything an ml engineer needs to know and uh, yeah. while nothing could be farther than the truth What's interesting about that advice and I've heard this on a couple of my other calls is you're both telling to them to go deeper as well as to go up and depending which way you draw that stack but you know to go down to the foundations of machine learning but also to think between the you know up into the product space and then into the business space and be one of those engineers who doesn't just say great I will, I love building stuff I'll build that but comes back and pushes back potentially on the on the product team or the business team and says we don't need machine learning here we don't need AI here we can do this far faster and far simpler if we take a different track mm-hmm. and I, that is such a, an undervalued skill so I love that you kind of took it in two directions there Yeah absolutely because those things go so well together i mean often business doesn't quite understand what ai can uh, do uh, they don't have the full picture if uh, if the right. ai people don't quite understand what's uh, important there either you always have this disconnect and and we have all seen this we have seen so many of these uh, companies uh, doing these massive investments in ai and uh, with uh, nothing to show for it 